for that lovely introduction uh, and uh, all your team, Harshi, Pallavi and the whole team and Sumit in particular um, for, um, you know, giving us the opportunity and giving me the opportunity to share some of our, uh, our my thoughts um, and hopefully the audience today uh, will learn um, a few different things um, which really give you a bit of extra depth uh, in understanding what we really mean by uh, employee benefit costs um, and what drives them. And once we understand that, I can then go on to some suggestions of how that can be applied um, in managing the effectiveness of them, um, specifically when it comes to um, applying that knowledge in the area of asset allocation and investments. So I hope you find the session um, useful. And as Hirsch mentioned, I should uh, probably finish in about 35 to 40 minutes, after which we want to allow for a good amount of time for uh, question and answers and um, look forward to that interaction uh, later on. So without further ado, let me just give you a quick outline of what I plan to cover uh, today. I'm going to start with a very basic, um, you know, couple of minutes, just so that everybody on the call today is at, you know, the same uh, level, uh, foundation and starting point, which just means, you know, what do we mean by long-term employee benefits? Um, and because that will set me up to use certain terminologies uh, over the next half an hour or so. What we then want to do is move on for, to understand and to outline some of those nuances of what we mean by measuring costs. Yeah? And hopefully you'll find that a, a, a sort of insightful uh, a take. Um, and secondly, with that, understand how those measuring of the costs um, are impacted by certain uh, risks uh, uh, that influence those costs. And when I speak about the, these uh, plans uh, going forward in this session, uh, two things to bear in mind for everybody. First of all, I'll be focusing on uh, corporates. So when I use the word sponsor or employer, um, I'm talking about corporates. Um, many of the theories and concepts that I mentioned today are also um, applicable in a broader social security and uh, public uh, individual retail perspective. But for today, all my examples and my uh, slant will be catered to the corporate environment. Um, so just to bear that in mind. Uh, once we understand the theory a little bit, I'll try and come up with, I've showed and try and show you a couple of examples to apply that knowledge in making investment decisions um, and asset allocation decisions. Very much so today, it's a cursory overview. I'm happy to then take the questions um, later on and go into depth um, offline if we need to or in a future session. And lastly, I thought we'd share some uh, recent insights. Uh, Hirsch mentioned about you know, the, the last three to four months. Uh, and the current environment. Um, I would like to share a couple of uh, insights from some studies that we at K Pundit have done, uh, and also some non-coronavirus uh, and COVID-19 related uh, insights with respect to some up, potentially upcoming regulatory updates that I think I should make you aware of, and also link nicely to the topic uh, that I'll cover today. So that's the broad outline of, of the session. So let me uh, quickly get on to just putting everyone at a level playing field. Uh, when we speak about employee benefits in its broadest sense, we have a few ways in which we slice and dice uh, the definition of employee benefits so that we can categorize the various types of benefits that corporates and us as employers provide their employees. So let me just outline a few of those uh, categories for you on this page, and then we can move forward. Um, first of all, at its most basic level, um, anything that an employer provides to its employees is an employee benefit. The first type of uh, way we can slice and dice this is on the left-hand side of the page. 
uh, uh, short-term benefits. They are immediately provided by the employer. The consumption of that benefit is immediate from the employee. And all relation between obligations and uh, commitments uh, and receipt of that is immediately completed. For example, a salary or a wage. You come to the end of the month, employer pays that month's salary, employee receives it, the commitment for that month is done as far as the cash salary is concerned, considered very short term, those type of uh, benefits. You then get long term benefits. They may be promises that an employer makes today, but the employee's consumption of that benefit or eligibility for that benefit may well be much further into the future. Now, this could include some of the retirement benefits that we're going to be talking most specifically about today. They could also be uh, long service awards. Um, they could be other kind of incentive awards, cash incentive awards. Um, so very much long term in nature, any carry forward of leaves, for example. So that's kind of long term in nature. You uh, then can split down the long term into even a further categorization. There are long term benefits that employees will get an opportunity con to consume whilst they are still in the service of the employer. And then there are long term benefits that the employee has the opportunity to benefit from or consume at the time when the employee and employer relationship ceases. So we call those post-employment benefits. And this is the largest component of what we're going to be talking about today um, and how it all relates. Other can be all those other types of benefits that are not necessarily always financial in nature. It could be training. It could be, um, you know, wellness, health and wellness initiatives and, and, you know, talent development. So those are sort of other type of benefits that are still benefits, um, but may not sort of form necessarily long term commitments um, and provisions and, and things like or a cash and monetary benefit for the employee. So directly. So those are one way of slice and dice. Now, going a little f deeper into the post employment and the long term employee benefits, we slice and dice these most typically across the world, especially uh, for when it comes to retirement benefits as either a defined benefit or a defined contribution. And just a few points here. Uh, defined benefit, the critical element here is that the actual benefit articulation is set out upfront. It's some type of formulae or some kind of fixed benefit. The point being, it is known in advance. The actual benefit method of calculation is known in advance. Whereas, um, what, uh, whereas when it comes to costs from a sponsor or an employer perspective, they don't know. Today, I cannot tell you in the future what it is going to cost ultimately, because all I'm doing is promising the benefit, but there are so many dependencies and contingencies for that benefit in the long term, that today as a sponsor, I don't know how much that costs. And we'll, we'll, I'll, they'll uh, become clear as I move forward. And usually in defined benefits, the sponsor is the employer and picks up the majority of the risk of the cost and the running of these plans. There may be certain uh, hybrids or nuances whereby some risks are shared with the employees. But in the main, uh, the majority of that financial risk is borne by the employer. Now, this all contrasts quite significantly as compared to defined contributions. For defined contributions, the employer has fixed the contribution rate, however they fixed it. But they know that that is all that they need to pay into this plan, that is their obligation, and that is their commitment. On the reverse, there is no uh, known guarantee for the employee 
as to what benefit they may get out of that contribution because it's going to be invested it's you know all of those conversion terms at the end they're not sure entirely today um, and therefore they pick up uh, a lot of the risk the employees pick up a lot of the risk okay uh, but the employer knows what its commitment is is upfront okay so that sort of just sets the, uh, the the playing field and sets the tone and and the scene for us now, I am going to focus on long-term and post-employment defined benefit plans provided by corporates uh, of us in India. So when we talk about measuring costs for these defined benefit plans, as I mentioned, an employer doesn't know what that cost is. So then, you know, how, how can I say, you know, what the cost of my plan is? Well, we have a theory in, in the sort of pensions world and the retirement world is that, you know, the cost of a traditional defined contribution plan is limited to the contributions. We know that. Whereas the only true time for a defined benefit plan that you actually know its total ultimate cost is at the very, very end of its life, when every person has been paid every benefit under that plan and there is no more uh, activity to take place in that plan. You can then look back throughout the whole history of that defined benefit plan and truly say, I now know what it cost us. So the actual cost of a plan will depend on, first of all, what the plan design is, you know, just actually the structure of the plan. And ultimately, what the actual experience was, how many people were in it, how many people received the benefit, when those benefits were paid. I can only do that looking back, and that is the actual cost of a defined benefit plan. But of course, in real practical terms and in real life, you can't wait for that. <laughs> uh, no one can wait for the end of a gratuity plan because it's ongoing, um, and the company hopefully is ongoing um, in the future. So how do you measure or express cost of a defined benefit plan in real life? Um, so we do find and come across a couple of ways when, when uh, people talk about cost for such a defined benefit plan, um, we use the word, you know, when we say cost, do we mean the contributions? Do we mean what's reported in the financial statements? It can depend on the situation. We, uh, all I would message here is that one should just be clear uh, or ask somebody who is talking about the cost, what do they actually mean? Are they at that time talking about contributions into the plan? Are they talking about the accounting profit and loss number, which also is a cost under, uh, you know, in the financial statements? Are they talking about that? Because the two are slightly different in terms of how they might have been derived. Um, so important to know that difference in expression. And how do you derive some of these um, is by the actuarial valuations. And the actuarial valuations do not determine the cost. They determine an estimate as on today in order to express what a contributions might need to be or express what the entries and the cost might be shown in the financial statements. But the actuarial valuation itself is not your cost. That is a method and science in order to derive an estimate of that at a particular point in time. And the actuarial valuations are so um, sort of uh, important as that foundation is because of all the unknowns. And these are where your risks are, your ultimate risks and unknowns in running any defined benefit plan comes from these financial and demographic unknowns. Today, you don't know what investment earnings you will get in the future. You don't know, based on the type of plan you have, whether what the future salaries will be, whether if you have a sort of a gift, retirement gift plan, which is linked to gold, um, you don't know what the gold price is going to be. It keeps going up and down, uh, especially uh, in times like these. So, um, you don't know those, and that's where the actuarial valuations at least come and help you in order to express contributions and express the financial statements accounting to come up with an estimate. 
And the same goes with the demographic. You don't know when these benefits are going to be paid today. Um, looking backwards, you knew, but looking forwards to plan, you don't know when they're going to be paid. And the dependency of when they're going to be paid will depend on when people leave the organization, so attrition, uh, if they um, come to their demise and there's benefits payable, so their mortality, and then utilization um, in leave plans. There are times when actually the accumulated balance, people can uh, avail from that balance whilst they are in service. So, you know, the cost of the plan will depend on how much people actually utilize. Um, in post-retirement medical health plans, again, we don't know how much medical treatment people will take today, but that will ultimately have a bearing on the actual cost. And therefore, the actuarial valuations of such plans will include elements of these uh, estimates in their assessment. So, and these are really on the right hand side what drives some of the costs in reality. But the actuarial will enable you to place an estimate on those in order to express how much contributions you need to make or want to make and how much you need to report on the financial statements. So I hope that's um, a, a good sort of explanation to you in terms of how to measure cost and what we come up with. So what does an actuarial valuation do? Firstly, uh, the most critical thing for an actuarial valuation is its purpose. Right? As I said, it's a foundation to be able to express in different ways what the business needs are. So what its purpose is, is fundamental to what kind of actuarial valuation I will conduct. It's either for accounting, it's either for the contribution setting, funding, it's either for a corporate transaction in a merger, spin-off, you're placing a value on the portion that is going to move, someone else is going to buy, um, et cetera. So there may be valuations required for those uh, circumstances. With respect to taking investment management decisions, long-term investment strat strategic asset allocation decisions, you want to understand some of the drivers of these costs, the co proportion of these costs in your overall promise as it is estimated today, and then take decisions accordingly. And that is what I will follow on uh, to dig a little deeper into uh, in terms of how to use these actuarial valuations uh, a little deeper in order to take investment management decisions. And finally, you might have individual calculations. Um, for example, when you're converting a certain accumulated balance to uh, a stream of payments, or you have um, an employee calculation where you calculate a, a valuation for an individual employee in order to transfer the value of that to another employer. That might also happen. Right? especially into group transfers, for example, in a, in a group company might happen. So those are purposes. After that, we need to come to a method. There are various actuarial methods out there. I'm not going to go through them today. Uh, however, what you should know is that different actuarial methods simply um, differ in how the overall cost estimate at a point in time is apportioned between what you can consider as already accrued in the past, and I should have funding for that, and what I might deem to accrue in the future, which I will meet by paying contributions in the future. And different actuarial methods change the balance between the apportionment of what is past and what is still to fund for in the future. Okay, and what is going to come in the future. So that's probably all I need to say, I will say today about actuarial methods. Once you have a purpose, a method which is appropriate for your purpose, you then come to the actual exercise, which is, you know your benefits, you look at the scheme, you look at the promises that are made, what the eligibilities are, what are the formulae, and whether you're paying it as a lump sum, whether you're paying it as a, a stream of payments in terms of form of payment. So you know those because they are defined. They're, they're part of the plan design. And then you put those together with the data and the setting of the assumptions, uh, and you will then conduct an exercise. The setting of the assumptions also will um, be done in conjunction with what your purpose is. And I'll talk about that in just 
30 seconds. But that is also, uh, you know, a, a, an important link to make that your assumptions will also be dictated by your purpose as well. And just a, a summary in terms of then when the handle is churned um, and, and the modeling is, is being done, what we actually do is for an obligation number, the estimated obligation number at a particular date, um, we are essentially taking a, pro we're projecting all the different types of benefits under your plan. We are multiplying that for every probability that a payment can occur. And because all of those potential payments are in the future, we will discount that back and apply a net present value calculation um, to bring it back to today's terms. So there's really those three major components in any actuarial valuation. And we then do this for every type of benefit that's under the plan, retirement, leaving service, death, et cetera, et cetera, and any others. We will do it for every single year in a cash flow approach, every single year between the valuation date and whenever a, pen, a pay, payment is made, um, uh, is set to be made, sorry. And we will do it for every employee. And then we'll aggregate the whole lot. Okay, so I thought I'd just sort of give you that overview. Now, coming to the purpose and why the different purposes are so important is it really, I wanted to show a distinction, um, what different valuations are actually used for and what differs. I'm not going to go through every single point on the slide, um, but just to give you some examples, we have our most common accounting valuations, the AS15, the IND AS19 valuations that have been around for a long, long time now. Their specific purpose is for disclosure and measurement for reporting in the financial statements. The assumptions for accounting valuations are actually, um, you know, the principles of those are set out in the accounting standards themselves. Actuaries have some leeway to work with a company to worry about what certain assumptions should be, but the principles that they should be best estimate, they should be long-term in nature, um, are set out in the accounting standards. Furthermore, the actual interest rate, the discount rate you use to do all the net present value is actually prescribed in the accounting standards. And the actuarial method is also prescribed. There's a particular projected unit method uh, that is prescribed. I can't use any other of the you know, half a dozen different methods to do the accounting valuations. And lastly, for accounting, everything is for a, in terms of a fair value method. Okay? Um, so it's market related. We're using market rated discount rates. We're using fair value of assets, etc. So that is an accounting. You then come to funding. You come to the contribution setting or the measuring of the financial health of the plan. What if you're funding these uh, plans? Now, what I like to describe the funding valuations as is almost like project, you know, in, in, in a company, um, infrastructure company or, a, you know, manufacturing or any, anything like that. And we internally have sort of, um, you know, internal uh, project costs, evaluations, you know, uh, when does it break even? Uh, what are the sort of internal rates of return that we want to generate from the investment we make? Those kind of concept is what I make the funding valuations analogous to. Um, have we got enough money to pay the benefits that we deem um, is a reasonable level of security using assumptions that are appropriate and um, relevant for me as an organization, taking into consideration the assets I have. And so I have a lot of flexibility in this way of setting the assumptions. We don't have any prescriptive way of doing this in India. Uh, in other countries, there are regulators that will um, give you checks and balances and minimum and maximums. But in India, we don't have that yet. So it's up to the employ uh, the company. And also the same goes with the actuarial method. It will be a choice um, because, as I said, it's all about that balance of apportionment of uh, how much you want to say that you want to build up 
versus how much of the overall benefits uh, obligations you will meet in the future through regular contributions. So I, you know, the actuarial funding methods for a funding valuation are very much, you know, determining for you what's appropriate. Think about it as like a project financing type valuation uh, for your DB plan. And um, uh, that should give you a very clear distinction from the regular financial reporting uh, valuations that we do. Um, and lastly, there is the asset liability or investment management type uh, exercises that are done, actuarial exercises that are done. The methodologies and the assumptions in the large part are mainly the similar to the funding because you're making business decisions. You're, you're trying to understand the impact of the different drivers of costs, um, what they are in your plan. That by which you can make decisions on investment strategy, on contributions, etc. And you can actually understand um, by taking certain asset positions in the long term and having asset allocations built up, whether performance of those assets in that manner, how does it move in line or out of sync with changes in what's going on with the actual obligation itself, because I actually have certain employees, I actually have a certain type of benefit promise. And so you try and understand in these valuations what um, the behavior is going to be of your liabilities and your obligations as compared to how your assets are behaving. And you decide as a set of trustees or as a, an employer how much you want those two in sync and how much you are willing to be out of sync because you are happy to have that higher risk tolerance and go for better return. Um, but the insight into actually how the cost drivers work through an actuarial exercise is very insightful for you. And I'll have a couple of examples in, in a couple of minutes. So that really is the sort of base uh, theory. Linking that one step further to now pulling together some of those risks, some of those cost drivers in, in DB plans. And I'm now going to start linking a bit deeper to the investments. Uh, number one, let's look at the type of plan that you have, the benefit design. What is the nature of that plan? Is it fixed? Is it inflationary linked in some way? So that actually would influence potentially suitable assets classes that could be used or tracked to assess the behavior of the liability, which is going to be in line with the nature of the plan, with the type of assets you may want to look at. The second big component is the duration or the term. Um, a, a fixed benefit that I need to pay tomorrow, I'm going to naturally keep the cash in my wallet to pay somebody tomorrow. But if I think that I'll, I know that I don't need to pay that benefit for maybe uh, five years, I'm obviously not going to keep that money in my wallet at the moment, depending on where you are in the world at the moment. But you're not going to keep that money in the wallet today. You're going to invest it somewhere. But you know what your commitment is in five years time. So the actual age profiling of the overall plan that you have and the employees you have, the type of service they've rendered already, upon what triggers does your benefit actually pay out will dictate how long or short that duration is and how much people are leaving the company and not becoming eligible for anything and whether the payment is immediately upon being eligible for payment or it's spread over a longer period of time will obviously impact the term. So linking the nature and the term starts helping you get an idea um, of what sort of longer term duration, do you, are there longer term assets that sort of move broadly in the long term in sync with your liabilities and commitments? And if you want to take a divergent position to that, at least you know what the baseline is. Um, are there shorter liquidity needs because you have a certain cohort of retirees that are coming up in the next five years and they may, you know, uh, through your insights, 
you may realize that there are a large proportion of the commitments you have today. So, okay, we need to be ready for those short-term commitments as well. So um, you can now see how the nature and the term starts linking to the thinking about how investments uh, allocations can be thought of in, in a macro sense, in a strategic sense. So hopefully that sort of covers the main part of the sort of theory. Um, I'm going to spend five minutes just giving you an example of applying that. So especially the nature and the term. Um, I just want to give a very quick, uh, simplified example of a gratuity plan. So I kept it very, very simple. And I'm going to take two individual people and I'm going to show you how their potential projected cash flows and commitments that the employer has made could be estimated to look very different. Um, and then you'll start uh, understanding what I mean. So let me get on to that straight away. So the first person I have here is a 45 year old. Um, it's a very basic uh, gratuity plan. So nothing much to be said there. Um, there's some basic assumptions there, there uh, around salary growth and service, but they really don't um, uh, have much bearing on actually what's, uh, what I want to show. Now, just to give you an idea of the axes here and the arrows before I actually get into the detail so you're not lost, um, the horizontal axes are the years in the future. I am doing this estimate today, and I've got years into the future for them until retirement age. Along the left-hand axes of both graphs, are the quantum of projected benefits with the allowance of the probability of that payment happening actuarially um, for each particular year. And the left-hand axis gives you a sense of scale uh, um, for all of the left-hand bars on the left-hand arrows, okay? So years one to 12, look at the left-hand axes. Year 13 is when this person is due for their retirement, giant retirement benefit, um, and their scale is just so huge because um, of the way the gratuity plans work that um, you just look at the axes on the right-hand side for the very last column only. Now, what do I, now having explained that, what do I want to show? Uh, what I want to show is that this 45-year-old, if they were in an organization where the typical attrition is about 3% per annum, then the intermittent potential ben uh, payments estimated by the time that they reach retirement, they're not expected to really leave the organization. So the actuarially uh, projected cash flow for, for this person is very, very small. Um, and th and also a larger proportion is kind of known today because my dark blue bar is my projected benefits, assuming that person's salary never changes again. And the light blue bar is the impact of just the future salary increases alone. So you can see that a large proportion of the potential commitment is actually known today in that sense because the salary increases are a proportion, but they're not a huge proportion. They, they are a, propor a larger proportion, but not an absolutely huge one. Okay? Um, until you get to the very end. And at the very end, uh, the salary increases have accumulated all of those 13 years and the light blue, as you can see, is almost just over 50% of the overall potential payment that we'll make to this retiree. And in fact, when you um, just do a quick net present value of these total numbers, then if I compare the bar in entirety with only the bar, um, which is dark blue, then the difference is actually double. Okay, so it's 200%, it's double. However, in a company where there is an attrition expected of over 10% per annum, then you can see that the projected payments until retirement are naturally going to be large, much larger because there's more chance of them actually being paid. And therefore, 
you see that um, the, the sort of scale has changed on the left-hand side. However, because now some of those payments are made on average earlier, the average time is now going to be about eight and a half years, the impact of future salaries is slightly less. Because now I'm, there's more chance of me paying benefits to this person because there's more chance that person's going to leave earlier. So the impact of salary is a little less. So this, the, you can see slight, the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Um, and the fact that actually higher the attrition in this particular example, actually lower the impact of the salary. And therefore, again, you may keep less real assets. You may want a larger proportion kind of locked in and dependent on the dark blue. So it's a useful insight to know what proportion different drivers, whether it be the inflation, whether it be salary, it could be something else, actually have in your breakup of your potential projected benefits so that then you can take certain investment decisions uh, accordingly. Just one more example. Now I've explained the first one. This one will be a lot more clearer to you. Uh, this one's a much younger person. Uh, and uh, so the impact overall of salary is far, far higher than the previous person. Uh, but the impact on attrition is similar. So you can see that obviously with an attrition of a very, very low level, you're really not going to be expecting to pay this person out. And the average time to payment expected could be about 17 years when you take into account all the probabilities and um, actuarial um, formulae. And whereas if they was to set to leave much more often, then you're expecting again to about pay them out at about eight years. So the impact of the salary is a little less. So um, it, the shape of the graphs and that insight hopefully starts getting you to link what I was saying in the, in the theory up front to how you could use some of these exercises in a bit more detail to then have a conversation with, you know, um, in, in your trustee committees and corporates of, of how to invest um, and at least use that as a base. Now, investment strategy, of course, is not the be all and end all of just matching cash flows and matching characteristics. Um, you ultimately need an objective to start with. Um, what it is you want out of getting these assets funded? Is it to strive for return and return only? Is it a what to what extent you're going to balance that with understanding of you know risk and commitments you have, um, with also the risk tolerance that you have in terms of volatility potentially of contributions, volatility potentially in your accounting financial reporting. Um, so all of these factors together will then determine overall what an investment strategy might look like. Um, and this component that I've been explaining for the last 20 minutes is one component that we haven't always seen in very much depth being used. Um, but we feel that, especially in the current times and over the next five years, we see a lot more of this potentially uh, being used because of the insights it gives and, and the sort of uh, handle that people are uh, getting uh, around in terms of governing their investments uh, for a better outcome for the company and for their employees. So hopefully that's given you a practical example of that. I'm just going to whiz through this slide um, just to sort of pull everything together for you. Um, you know, we make investment uh, decisions, and these are the types of options of DB plans in India that we have. Um, ultimately, we don't have mandatory funding and mandatory requirement to set aside investments for our defined benefit plans in India yet. Um, so we do have a, a initial question, unfunded or funded, and there are various uh, points that go into that decision wasn't going to go through them in any detail today, uh, with the exception that you know there is a decision to make. All of you mostly have decided or will be deciding to fund for your benefits for various reasons that are uh, uh, either to do with tax benefits, wanting of security, or managing uh, cash flow from the company in order to uh, meet these obligations and smoothen those out. Um, and benefit from having invested funds. So you've largely taken the de in, uh, decision to fund. Once you funded, 
you now have another set of decisions to make. How fast do you want to contribute and meet those costs? Well, that might, again, depend on various things with respect to the company itself um, and its, its philosophy. Um, what is the level of funding you're happy with? Is it 80%? Is it 90%? Is it 100%? Uh, where do you want a buffer? So you're setting your hurdle um, at times so that then you can determine what level of uh, contributions you want to pay in to achieve in the long term as far as a level of funding is concerned. And then you ultimately, of course, have assets and contributions that the, the trust is going to receive that need to be deployed. They can be deployed by you know, self-managing. So the, the, the sponsor and the trustees are looking after the money uh, very much so in-house um, and, and, and uh, looking at that self-managed approach. Or alternatively, uh, which is a, a huge... Uh, Kulun, uh, you went on mute. Hello. Hi, hopefully that wasn't a long time ago that I went on mute. When was it that I went on mute? And I'll just pick oh, up from there. No, Kulun, it was a couple of uh, seconds only, so nothing. No, you okay, fair speak. enough. I think it was probably it. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Sorry about that, everybody. I'm just uh, managing the different windows. Um, so you, uh, the vast majority will uh, insure a managed fund. And within the insurance managed funds, of course, there is you know, various products. Um, the, uh, and the products and the solutions are getting increasingly sophisticated, increasingly looking at some of these um, support mechanisms to understand and manage your funds which are aligned to some of the inputs that I've given in the last half an hour. Um, so hopefully those additional insights will help you have these conversations um, with whoever's managing your funds even deeper. And I know HDFC has a various uh, set of products um, with a various set of solutions that actually speak to some of these things about different proportions at different points in time and different asset classes. Um, and so with the insights that an actuary can give you, um, you can actually start making those decisions yourself uh, along with everybody, the investment managers and the trustees, the employer and the actuary together. Um, so we've covered all of those things. I'm going to whiz through for the next uh, two to three minutes, and I'm, I'm conscious we want to get through some Q&A, um, just to give you some insights and bring it back home to current times. Uh, just a quick, uh, we did a quick dipstick survey throughout sort of May, April and May of this year, um, because just after the March, accounting valuations were all due for everybody. Um, we thought we'd reach out to clients. So we got about just under 50 clients coming back to us over a period of about a month. Um, and they, a large majority, of course, said that their businesses are going to be impacted either highly or moderately over the next sort of six to 12 months um, as a result of everything that's going on. I'm very conscious that this is sort of now already a month and a half or two months old and the world has moved on yet again. Um, however, in, term, in terms of uh, what clients were telling us what they want to use for certain assumptions in their assessments, uh, they were saying that salary growth should certainly be re-looked at and should fall. A majority, about 70%, felt that an assumption that is low for the first one or two years, so maybe for 2021 and 2022, is um, looked at and after that is something that may revert back to a longer term assumption. And in the short term, uh, a vast majority felt that a, a, a salary assumption of between two and 5% was, was reasonable in their mind. And similarly for attrition, we also uh, found out that about 60% felt that again, the, a lower attrition assumption should be taken. A uh, lot of uncertainty. This is, we're talking about voluntary attrition as opposed to um, forced attrition, by the way. So um, in the short term, a lowering of that rate was, uh, was fed back to us and an assumption of around 5 to 10% per annum over the next few years was something that 
you know, a, a, a large, uh, significant uh, majority felt was appropriate. So that, that again, the world's moved on and we're going to do this every six months for the next uh, year or so to see how things change and how sentiments change um, with companies. And lastly, with some uh, upcoming developments, um, the wages code, the social security code um, has been in place uh, in a draft format for uh, about three years now, and it is now at its very final leg. Um, it's, there's a standing committee report that was published on the 31st of July 2020, and I believe then it will be, you know, some very minor modifications will be made, and it should be then taken for uh, tabling formally um, and moving forward to uh, getting it signed off and uh, notified in the next few months, I would have thought. Um, and so what's important about this? Well, I've just picked up on one aspect, which is the gratuity. There are many other things in the Social Security Code, but just one for today um, I've picked up on. Firstly, definition of wages. Uh, many of you will be aware of the wages code that was already published um, some time ago in 2019, I believe. Um, and that changes the way the sort of um, components should be clubbed together. Uh, and specifically, wherever the word wages is used for the purposes of certain benefits, there is actually a proviso to say that uh, components for the purposes of wages in calculating for certain benefits will be at least 50% of the overall um, sort of wage or, or you know, CTC. So um, the Social Security Code does explicitly, again, mention this definition of wages, and it does say that the gratuity formula will be 15 by 26 for every year of service of wages. So something that you've probably all started looking at already because it affects provident funds in the future. Uh, it's already affecting uh, other codes. This social security code will impact the way gratuity potentially is calculated as far as the proportion of pay that will be considered in the calculation. The second thing is that they have reiterated an old uh, clause in the Gratuity Act. They have clubbed that into here to uh, confirm that at some point a compulsory funding through an insurance or other vehicle will be mandatory. Um, in the past, it was always there in the Gratuity Act, but no one except for, I believe, Andhra Pradesh has actually ever notified the same. But here, in the Social Security Code, they've actually gone one step further and actually had have got some clauses that talk about exemptions um, from this as far as paying employee, uh, sorry, the contributions and setting up an own trust. It talks about the ability to, for employers with 500 employees or more to set up their own trust brand new um, and things like that. So in the past, it was just a one-liner. Um, but now it's the one liner plus a bit of depth. Um, so it gives indications that this may potentially uh, definitely be notified and further regulations with this effect um, following the announcement of the Social Security Code may well come into play in future years to come. So something for us to be prepared for. And then finally, there's also mention about certain compliances that, you know, establishments will have to be registered with a competent authority, even for gratuity, and also about, you know, there will be future regulations with respect to how trusts and board of trustees should operate and be governed. So um, that was the sort of social security aspect. And just to give you an idea of the first point around the wages, we did a very, uh, you know, sort of dipstick uh, study with some of the data that we have at the firm. Um, on an aggregated basis, and uh, without going into too much detail um, into all the different components of CTC, we have some aggregated gross salary details and the basic salary details because we do the actuarial valuations for different type of plans. We put them all together um, and, and across about a thousand firms tracked over the last four to five years how the percentage of basic salary to gross salary has been sort of a simple ratio has been tracking. And you can see that 
pretty much is about 30 percent of the companies have got a basic salary that is more than or around 50 percent of the gross everyone else is less which initially prima facie um, is the extreme case that may be that everybody outside um, that 30 percent may well have some type of increase um, in the calculation of wages when it comes to calculating benefits and potentially contributions to um, social security. So um, something to keep an eye on. Um, it does vary by industry a little bit, and we are going to be coming out with a bit more of a uh, white paper on this with a, a few more details. So for today, I'll leave it there and give you that um, insight. Um, and so just as a key takeaways before we have five, seven minutes for um, Q&A is defined benefit costs. Hopefully you remember now that there's a way to express the cost, but those expressions come from um, the actual um, exercise that is rooted in actuarial science, but the actuarial valuation does not determine the cost. Um, so methods and assumptions of that actuarial valuation um, are chosen for the particular purpose for which you want to express cost or some other decision-making tool. Um, you can look at those insights and use those insights when you are um, particularly trying to understand the nature and term of your obligations in order to then look at how you might use those to optimize funding as well as asset allocation and investment strategy. Look at the costs, uh, look at your estimates, review what's going on in your actual organization at the moment in the current times and what you foresee over the next six to 12 months. Do get intermittent and inter inter uh, interim measurements if you need to so that you're not you know, uh, uh, sort of surprised later down the line in March 2021 what, what sort of your estimates are looking like you should probably uh, get some interim assessment done in the meantime and um, watch out for some impending changes in the future um, and, and we'll keep you abreast of that. So um, hopefully you found that useful and um, I look forward to interacting with all of you over some of the Q&A. And um, Harsh, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that uh, we can answer some Q&A. Sure, Pauline, and I think there are a couple of questions which have uh, popped up in the chat box. Uh, we'll take it one by one, and would like to have your uh, thoughts on the same. Harshi, can we can we go ahead with the questions which are there in the chat box, please? Yeah, Harsh. Uh, so, Pauline, one of the questions is, uh, with same set of data and assumptions, actuarial valuation differs between two actuaries on a particular date. Can, can there be a, any plausible, uh, plausible explanation for this? If so, on the assumption that two actuaries uh, are doing their sums correctly, then there can be some small variations uh, indeed. Um, and, for, and I'll give you two examples. One example is within the actuarial modeling, you might determine a certain timing of cash flow either at the beginning of a year, the middle of the year, or the end of the year. So for example, if I have a set of data today, when am I assuming the next salary increase actually takes place? And what does the model actually allow for? It could be a simple, it's in one year's time. It could be that they've asked the client and the client has said, well, actually my salary increases are in six months time. So the model can allow for that. So, uh, and similarly goes uh, for the discounting as well. Um, you, you know, the period at which you're discounting for could be applied only year to year or in the middle. So those are a couple of examples where there can be um, rule of thumb internationally over my career. Uh, usually if you're within around, um, you know, two to five, 4%, 5% 5 
um, it probably just means that it is a small little modeling thing like that, but it doesn't impact too much on the overall conclusions of what you're trying to show. So next question is, what kind of adjustments need to be made in the valuation projections to account for the COVID situation, which has resulted in increased attrition? Yes, so there's two. Uh, thanks for that. It's very, very pertinent and relevant. And um, so I'll just go back to uh, these insights that we had and, and we saw from the companies we asked about the current situation. Um, a few things to note here. Uh, when it comes to attrition specifically, and there is, of course, two types of attrition. You will have attrition that is, you know, um, compulsory attrition, uh, and you will have the voluntary attrition. So first of all, make sure that the one-offs are separated out mentally uh, then from the ongoing. And why I say that is that you do not want the one-offs to influence how you might look at a long-term trend uh, for your attrition assumption when you are doing an actuarial exercise. Because the actuarial exercise you do today is for the future. Secondly, if you feel that there is voluntary attrition that is going to be more or less in the short term as compared to the sort of you know, longer term, then one can actually set assumptions which are time dependent. So what we've been doing is saying, well, you know, we can apply X percentage attrition for 2021 and something else for 2022. Similarly for salary as well, in fact, as, as I was mentioning on our key findings. So you can actually start making the uh, assumptions time dependent as well. And that, and that should hopefully help. Um, other things to watch out for. If you have, um, we are going to be coming out with a short note. Um, there are some, or, um, the accounting standards board, if I talk about accounting valuations for a moment only, um, the accounting standards board has come up with a compendium of various different sort of guidances that they have given over the last few months respect to COVID. And um, especially when it comes to post balance sheet events um, and the significance of those and how much it should be allowed for. So what I would encourage, if there have been significant you know, events post March um, that influence the validity of the measurement that you are actually making as on March, have a word with your auditor, and that may well, you know, include some of the impending, uh, uh, in you know, sort of compulsory attritions and things like that. Have a word with your auditor whether the significance and the materiality of those events um, trigger you to actually remeasure those um, obligations from your actuary again, as at March, because of the post balance sheet events whilst you're conducting your audit. Yeah. So next question is, what is the uh, best practice to be followed in terms of offering gratuity uh, to employees? Should it be a part of their CTC or over and above that? I've been seeing this one um, uh, on some discussion forums um, for a while now, um, and it just came up again um, over the last couple of days, in fact. Um, gratuity within CTC. Um, I think it's really on, and this is more a personal view than um, and a, sort of my personal professional view uh, as a retirement and, a, and an HR um, consultant, is I think this concept of CTC and showing an employee how much the employer is kind of, um, you know, giving, uh, giving them a benefit for um, is fine and well when it is very easy to measure and particularly when it's defined contribution in nature. The issue with a gratuity plan is, in my personal view, is the fact that because it is a defined benefit plan, um, there are so many variables, whether the cost is actually 4.81, which is the typical accrual formula that's used in the CTC. Um, there's also the fact that some employees may not actually ever be eligible for that payment. And also the end cost may not be 4.1 for the very reasons that I've been uh, gave all my slides. It could be less, it could be more. An extreme scenario, an extreme scenario to illustrate this point is 
take a situation where you have every single person in the f- company already maxed out at the gratuity limit of 20 lakhs and the company only provides benefits to that extent in the sense they only follow gratuity act they're not going to provide anything more because they're meeting the law of the land and that's it okay now in that extreme case no matter what service and whatever happens with those employees in terms of them rendering more service in the organization their 20 lakhs is not going to change so uh they've accrued their 20 lakhs there's no further technical cost as such more for the employer um, and so then in those situations i have seen it argued especially that why is then 4.81 shown as a cost um in the employee's ctc so i i would just sort of uh, you know see how you're breaking up the ctc i think that as long as it's being explained that is a deemed illustrative value to employees um, of what the gratuity is then you know the the uh, compensation and benefits or hr um, teams uh, of how they communicate that to employees i think is the most important thing rather than the amount itself yeah, just to follow up question uh, what is the quantum of companies that offer gratuity as a part of ctc of employees i would need to go back and and check um what specific information we might have about that um in my general experience um it has been a, a mix i would say it's been quite a balanced mix um when we've been doing some rewards consulting in the past um it very much has been a a, a quite a split um of companies of how they're including it or not including it within the ctc just to um uh put everyone at rest in one small aspect is that in the definition of wages under the new codes the any gratuity received by an employee does not form part of that count of overall wages um so just just to sort of they've made a very explicit exclusion for that um in the definition of wages which i know is slightly different than the actual day to day ctc but i thought i'd just highlight that point yeah so next question is what not so obvious immediate flags apart from the obvious ones of cost estimate should trustees be cognizant of with the possible change of definition of wages from basic plus da uh, dns allowance to total ctc yes so um couple of things one is just to reiterate that the definition change um is saying that the calculation of wages for the purposes of working out such benefits like gratuity the amount that's considered if your basic salary is not 50% of the overall amount then the wages considered for the calculation of the benefits it will be made up to be 50% of the overall um you know car a uh, ctc uh with all the different exemptions and and calculations that are in the code so that's the first thing as far as trustees is concerned i think that yes there's cost um but in addition to that i think it's a bit more sort of practical um look at your trust deed and rules what is defined in there do you need to update those number 2 are the, uh, we will get to know um when the implementation happens whether they are going to do anything retrospectively or fingers crossed for industry everything is prospectively um so only people who leave going forward so at least then you don't need to worry about you know having to recalculate and things like that thirdly um look at the administration processes uh, look at the workflows uh, of how the benefits are calculated and when it actually all gets implemented in the future make sure that the formally uh, whoever is calculating the actual benefits um, have got it right 
Um, so I think in addition to that, you, uh, in, to, in addition of just the cost, you've got more practical and logistical administrative things to look at. So next question is, what are your uh, what are your views on discounting rates projected from for thirty thirty uh, first March twenty one vis a vis thirty first March twenty based upon ten year GSEC yields? Yes. Um, so the tw the twenty twenty rates uh, saw a significant decrease, of course, uh, as compared to two thousand and nineteen. We've seen them be relatively more stable after that. Um, they haven't dropped significantly low. There's been times when it's been lower, when it's gone a little bit higher. Um, now tw to 2021, which was your ultimate question, um, I really wouldn't like to say. Um, I think what should what companies should be doing is we should be looking at projected figures as on 2021 under a, maybe two or three different scenarios so that uh, companies can start provisioning their financial books um, to reach a particular uh, target so that when the real discount rate comes along in 2021, your delta um, uh, is not as great as it potentially could have been. Um, so, um, you know, we don't see it significantly increasing. Um, it's certainly not going to go down to potentially, you know, very, very low. But, you know, is it going to be seven? Is it going to be seven and a half? Is it going to be six and a half? Will it go 5.75? Very difficult to say. Uh, very difficult to say. Um, but uh, we do, uh, we keep a track of it, um, obviously, internally every day. We do publish something um, every quarter uh, for what's happening with bond movements. And um, as soon as we're able to give a bit more of a, uh, a view, and maybe the investment uh, folks will have a better view in terms of what's happening behind the scenes um, with discount rates, we'll, we'll let everyone know. So just one last question, Colin. How the contribution period assumptions in actuarial are considered and how they differ from earlier years? Could you just repeat that question again? Sorry. So how the contribution period assumptions in actuarial are considered and how they differ from earlier years? Okay. Okay, let me try and see what, um, what is meant by that question. Um, so I think when it comes to contribution, um, in our defined benefit plans in India, we've not had... Um, you know, any requirement to do setting of contributions in a particular way. And that is what I was mentioning at the start of my presentation about the difference of accounting valuations and funding valuations. What you are speaking about in terms of contributions is the funding valuations. Now, uh, in the ma majority of cases, uh, where companies are getting their funding valuation done uh, is typically the contribution statements that come or estimates that come from the insurance companies when you are working with them to see how much you should pay into the fund. Now, going forward, or what you can also consider in conjunction with that is to get a little bit more detail, uh, like I described and I showed those graphs, etc. And assumptions in the contribution setting exercises can be a lot more um, flexible. And the one example I will leave you with for now is when it comes to a discount rate, the interest rate for the present value calculations, when we are doing that calculation for a uh, financial reporting valuation, the NDS or the AS15 valuations, that rate is prescribed. That is, says in the accounting standards, I have to use a government bond yield. I have to. When you are looking at the contributions, setting of contributions, 
you have a lot more flexibility. And back to the point that I said that look at the contribution setting exercise or funding valuation exercise, more like a project financing, which means that the discount rate I might want to use, one of the options is I may want to use what I think the rate of return on my assets will be, because that gives me a much closer uh, measure for me to know how much you know contributions I should pay into the fund. I don't necessarily have to measure it with in line with the central government bond deals, for example. So that's one very clear example where they may differ um, in a contribution setting exercise. So hopefully that's answered the question, um, but happy to chat offline or connect offline um, if uh, that didn't manage to answer your question. Yes, uh, Kulin, one more question has popped up and this will be the last one that we are taking because we are running out of time. Yeah. Could you please share your experience on returns on plan assets, historical trend? Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's uh, varied quite a lot, of course, um, because it's going to depend on what kind of asset classes you have. Um, if I go back to my uh, slide with the big tree diagram, we on the bottom right hand corner was um, you know uh, self managed versus insurer plan and within insurer plan was traditional and unit linked now in terms of return on plan assets um, historically uh, traditional uh, insurance plans um, have varied anywhere between sort of um, seven and a half eight nine maybe even in some very uh, limited instances, even higher than nine in, in, in the sort of broad range. Unit linked could be anything because it is market linked and even your bonds within a unit linked are subject to price movements. Um, but of course, your range for the equity portion and under unit linked plans of insurance managed funds, you can have a higher proportion of equities than you can uh, under other uh, products and other uh, self-managed funds because of the uh, Ministry of Finance laws. So in unit link plans, the equity component, of course, in the long term, you know, has been higher, it's been double digit plus. Um, the bond portfolios will range again uh, year on year, but be, will be probably in the region of your you know, uh, seven to 10%. Um, so uh, those are kind of typical ranges. And then of course, it depends on which year you're talking about, which fund manager you're talking about and all of that. But hopefully that gives you a broad range uh, to go on for now. Thank you so much, Colin. Thank you everybody for joining in. I'll just uh, pass on to uh, Harsh for a uh, word of thanks. So, Kulin, a great session. Uh, I think it was very enriching. And if we go across to the participants, I believe the feeling will be no different. Uh, from On behalf of HGFC Life and all the participants, I would like to thank you for the valuable insights that you provided in such a critical aspect of managing DB pensions, DB employee benefit schemes. And I'm looking forward for further interaction with you, with the participants, as well as on one-on-one -on -one basis. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for the association. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.